just going to go over some of the homework questions and annotation uh, close reading questions for the end of Act 2, Scene 3 and Act 3, Scene 1. The first one concerns lines 306 to 308 at the end of Act 2, Scene 3 and asks, how do these lines reveal Yago's understanding of a fellow sense of sexual inadequacy? These ones here. It says, I may say so in this respect, for that he hath devoted and given up himself to the contemplation mark and denotement of her parts and graces. Now, what Yago seems to understand here is this sense of sacrifice that um, Othello has enacted effectively in, in sealing this relationship with Desdemona. He says he has devoted and given up himself. So he has entirely sacrificed who he is, his complete power of his identity, to the contemplation mark and denotement of her parts and graces. So there's this sort of proliferating ling linguistic sense of rapt attention in these lines, suggesting that Othello has completely surrendered himself to a sort of luxurious obsession. Parts are natural gifts, but obviously in this particular context, and because it's Iago, we know that he, there's always a sexual connotation not far away. So the denotement of her parts and graces obviously has this sense of kind of rapturous fixation with with Desdemona's appearance and her youth and her beauty. So what this seems to reveal to us is, is the sense of Othello's inadequacy by virtue of the fact that he is so deeply devoted to this obsessive fixation with, with his wife. The second question says, how do these lines reveal Iago's ability to use ambiguity to conflate a sense of Desdemona's virtue with her sexual promiscuity. We're talking about 310 to 312 and 329 to 332. So here in these lines, she is of so free, so kind, so apt, so blessed a disposition that she holds it a vice in her goodness not to do more than she is requested. So what we have here is this kind of this language that, again, we associate with these positive abstractions that Yago is so critical of, free and kind and um, blessed, that she believes it's a vice in her goodness, in her kind of saintliness, not to do more than people ask her to. But again, there is a sexual connotation in these lines that she in some way can't help herself, but to be more kind of open and, and sexually inviting than, than she has been requested to be. This is continued a little over the page here. On 329 to 332, where Iago says, To win the more again, tis most easy. The inclining Desdemona to subdue in any honest suit, she's framed as fruitful as the free elements. So we've got here this sense of it's easy to subdue Desdemona. And again, this is quite a violent or domineering phrase to use. But he means initially it's easy to persuade her to pursue an honest cause. But it's easy to subdue her because she is already inclined. She's already attracted to someone of an honest suit, someone of some fame. You know, the word honest has this connotation of honor and fame and, and, and renown. That the again within these lines there is this suggestion of Desdemona's being kind of promiscuously inclined to find someone attractive if so long as they are suitably kind of honorable in society. She's framed as fruitful as the free elements. And I think these, this alliterative language here draws attention deliberately to this fruitful, again, has this very deliberate sexual connotation of her being kind of um, ripe for the picking, so to speak. And I think obviously connects to the strawberries that are embroidered on Othello's handkerchief. But she's as fruitful as the free elements. She, she you know, is as loose as the wind, effectively. The third question asks us about 319. How does the ambiguity of this line rob the word honest of its value? So Iago says at the top of the page, 
I protest in the sincerity of love and honest kindness. So we have this suggestion that somehow his his advice to Cassio is carried out in sincere love and honest kindness. And I think there's this sort of, the, the verbal excess of positivity in these phrases, I think, suggests at the, the sort of untruthful nature that this honest kindness that he seems to be able to act out because he is carrying out this advice for his own selfish motives, I think in some way it debases um, the value of this word honesty because we see it so freely being performed to fulfil the opposite of its meaning. The fourth question, 338 to th 333 to 338, further down. How do these lines reveal the frailty of Othello's virtue, his enslavement to Desdemona's body, and Othello's sense of sexual inadequacy? He says, to win the more were to renounce his baptism, all seals and symbols of redeemed sin, his soul is so infected to her love. Here we have this sense, I think, of, of, of Othello's Christianity and his forceful conversion and sense of Christian virtue being kind of frail and fragile. To win the more it were to renounce his baptism, all seals and symbols of redeemed sin, his soul is so infected to her love. So there's this suggestion here that, that it is easy to rid Othello of these outward signs of his supposed Christian virtue, because they are seals and symbols of his redeemed sin, and that it will result in him renouncing his baptism, because his soul is so infected to her love. And again, these lines, these three lines, grimly foreshadow actually the conclusion of the play, whereby Othello's violent behaviour does effectively renounce his Christianity because of his soul's enslavement to love for Desdemona that she may make unmake do what she list that she is entirely in control of the relationship she may make unmake and do whatever she 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 wants because of Othello's enslavement to her even as her appetite shall play the god with his weak function even as her own appetite again he constantly conflates the consumption of food with, with sexuality here. And her appetite is the god to Othello's impotence, his weak function, his inability to perform. So there's within these lines is this con you know, this advice that is somehow convincing Cassio that Desdemona can sort of redeem him in his position. But within all of this suggestion is all of this suggestion of, of her innate sexuality and Othello's um sexual impotence. Question five, how do these lines make use of the colour symbolism used throughout the play to give an impression of Yago's wicked capacity for dissemblance, 340 to 343? He says, divinity of hell. When devils will the blackest sins put on, they do suggest at first with heavenly shows as I do now. You know, here, he, you know, he, he's on his own in the soliloquy and we hear the insides of his of his internal workings of his mind and he invokes again the divinity of hell which is itself a kind of uh, an oxymoron of sorts you know you don't really have the divine of hell apart from you know the, the story of of the fall of, of of lucifer is effectively divinity in hell and he says when devils will the blackest sins put on they do suggest at first with heavenly shows as i do now this colour symbolism of black and white, of damnation and virtue, of, of sinfulness and, and sinlessness is invoked here. When devils will appear to be doing the worst and most sinful behaviour, or be carrying out the most sinful behaviour, they suggest at first with heavenly shows. They, they appear to be doing the opposite. They first of all appear to be doing the complete inverse of this dark, sinful behaviour. So again, here... His wicked dissemblance is, is a self-conscious kind of reflection on his ability to appear one way and behave in a completely different way. <laughs> the next question, question six. How does this synesthetic image show how language can be manipulative? Three, four, six to seven. I'll pour this pestilence into his ear that she repeals him for her body's lust. So we have this image of pouring 
pestilence as a kind of poison and, and plague into Othello's ears. But obviously what he's talking about is the, the, the slanderous suggestions that he's going to carry out in Act 3, Scene 3. Um, that's going to poison his relationship with us and it be becomes like a pestilence. So this pouring of noise becomes a synesthetic image that deliberately, I think, shows us the sense of pleasurable control that he takes from um, manipulating these two individuals. That she repeals him for her body's lust is that she reinstates Cassio or seeks his reinstatement for her own bodily desire. And this is the lie that he is going to tell Othello in the, in the next major scene, Act 3, Scene 3, to inspire his jealousy. The next question is, the extended metaphor of the spider's web. How does it resurface here to show the way in which Iago intends to subvert abstractions like virtue? We're talking about in these in this section, lines 350 to 352. So I will turn her virtue into pitch and out of her own goodness make the net that shall enmesh them all. So I will turn this abstract ideal of virtue into pitch into black sticky tar like material i will blacken her white virtue and out of her goodness so from her sense of abstract virtue construct the net that shall enmesh them all construct a spider's web that will enmesh them all in it you know if ever you needed a suggestion that Iago is evil, these, these metaphorical spider's webs that he's constantly constructing to trap individuals are probably the clearest sign of his innate evil. Final question, how might we read the rejection of the witchcraft label here, ironic considering Robantio's insistent use of this semantic field to criticise Othello in Act 1? We're looking at lines 361 three, one, three, to 362. How poor are they not are they that have not patience? So he's he's having a go at Rodrigo here for basically not being patient after he turns up with all his money spent and he's been well cudgeled, he's been beaten up. I think the issue will be to have so much experience for my pains and so with no money at all and little more experience and intelligence, I return again to Venice beaten up and with nothing. Iago responds, what wound did ever heal but by degrees? Thou knowst we work by wit and not by witchcraft, and wit depends on dilatory time, time unfolding. This is asking us, though, how we, how we read the rejection of, of witchcraft here as being ironic, considering Brabantio's insistent use of this semantic field to criticise Othello in Act 1. Now, Brabantio, when he uses this, is, is effectively saying to us that the... The suit between Othello, or Othello's suit of Desdemona is illogical and that her agreeing to be in a relationship with him makes so little sense that it can only have been carried out through supernatural means, through the mechanism of witchcraft and magic. And that here, Iago is himself rejecting this, this label of, of, of it not being by witchcraft. And wit depends on dilatory time. So in effect of this here, he, he ironically rejects this, this sort of label of the supernatural in order to carry out a manipulation that is itself a kind of witchcraft. It's a sort of a, a linguistic magic that he carries out here and that comes from, you know, the, the, the insider identity of the white Venetian soldier. So that if anyone is using witchcraft in this play, it's Iago. And there's the, the central irony of this language in this line. 